Right on, my man. Well, we're uh, we're on schedule. Let's get rolling. We got a bunch of folks on live with us, and right. um, so I uh, I like to kind of start these off. Number one, by thanking you for giving us some of your time being here with us, and I'm gonna let me split my screen here real quick. There we go. Um, so I like to start by thanking you, but I also kind of like to start about uh, or tell stories about how we uh, first got connected. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but it was 2012. I believe, and it was Idea uh, 35, their anniversary. Jane Fonda was getting inducted into the Hall of Fame and a whole bunch of other things. And I'd never gone to one of these events before. Yeah. So I'm down there and uh, Zumba was just the, I mean, it was everywhere. Everybody had the gear on. There were thousands right. of people there. And I was like, what is with the outfits and what's going on? And I have, I'm just kind of walking around and I'm getting overwhelmed by all this. I was working with the NSCA at their booth. And Ace wasn't too far away. And we, you and I ended up kind of running into each other and we started chatting a bit. And I had read a bunch of your stuff online and was just a kind of a fan of your content that you put out oh, in the cool. first place. And, uh, and so I'd, out of this whole experience, I wasn't, I wasn't real big on the Zumba craze that seemed to be kind of the dominance. I was like, the best part of this whole weekend was meeting Pete and getting to hang out with him and, t and chat a little bit. And oh, cool. ever since then, we've been kind of staying in touch and you know, getting to chat together and you give me the opportunity to contribute to some of your uh, content that you put out and your articles and, and your podcast and such. So I, uh, I appreciate it. I really appreciate the, uh, the friendship and the, the colleague uh, professional development opportunities that we have together. So thank you for that. And oh, thank, thank you, you for the time hanging with us today. So we appreciate it. Sure. If, uh, if you would, just kind of give a, a quick little intro of yourself, uh, anybody that, that might not be familiar with you. Uh, that's on here with us and um, we'll go from there um yeah no so i want to say thank thank you robert no and i remember you know it's been fun getting to know you over the years and uh trading the emails and when we do we're together at live events it's always fun and, and i think you're right man i think the most interesting thing before i give a brief background is have you ever been at one of the nsca events it was like 2005 2011 and i don't remember if it's been since 2011 oh, it was 2008 too when Idea World and NSCA National were both happening at the same time in Las Vegas. Yeah. And it was like <laughs> conference week. Yeah. It was like conference <laughs> week. There. But at NSCA, it was all guys like you and I, you know, yeah. everybody, no, you know, no hair, short hair, golf shirts, you know, all these guys, you know, waddling around, stocky guys. Yeah. And then you go, you know, three miles away and over to the Idea World. And Whole it's different all, world. Yeah. You know, I always say that, that the fitness is kind of like a solar system, right? And, and, yeah. and, each, and we have different planets. So like the idea of commercial fitness is one planet. Yeah, bodybuilding is this whole other planet. You have the strength and conditioning world is a different planet. So it's like we're all part of the same system, but we each have our own separate planets. So I think it's, the, it's, just, it's just funny to, to yeah. kind of be able to acknowledge that. The, um, the 2011, that year, just to, to, I don't mean to cut you off there, no, but no. that year we had, so the NSCA used to do the personal trainers conference and the tactical strength and conditioning back to back. So they would basically rent out a space for six days and they would do like Friday to sat to Sunday would be personal training. And then the TSAC would be Monday through Wednesday. And then idea was Wednesday to Sunday. So I was wow. there for like 10 days. I think that's the year we're talking about and 10 days in Vegas. You're like, three, <laughs> three days, days in Vegas. great. Yeah. yeah so we, 10 days in Vegas. I was wow. like, I can't do this again. This that was too much especially with your, with your business. So that's, that's yeah. crazy. That's funny. There's, it'll be interesting. I mean, now that so much of this stuff is going online, Robert, and I know people are doing some really, people are really adapting to the current situation, you know, really with online education. So I'll be really interested in seeing how it, you know, what, how the, the live conference, you know, kind of what happens to it as a result, you know, yeah. how, how, it, how it affects that. Well, we're not going to take a trip too much further down memory lane, uh, but for, for people on, on the call, um, I'd like to say, yeah, thank you for Robert to, for inviting me again. And thank you all for joining us. But I've been an educator now for a number of years. I've been a personal trainer, uh, I've been a strength coach since 2001 and a personal trainer since 1998. Um, and for the last number of years though, I've really, you know, I've really been focusing on the education. My main client for education has been Nautilus and Stairmaster. The parent company is Core Health and Fitness. But my main, I've been really developing education kind of on strength training and high intensity interval training. You know, Nautilus is a strength brand, Stairmaster is a hit brand, but my main emphasis has been really trying to understand how exercise influences the aging process. So as a result, that's why I started my podcast, All About Fitness. I host the All About Fitness podcast. I post, at least try to get one new episode up, one new interview every week. So I'm trying to release three or four interviews a month, uh, along with some other things I call quick pit tips. 
But the point of the podcast is to help people understand how to use exercise to slow down the aging process. And then I wrote uh, my first book, Smarter Workouts, was generally to just learn how to exercise smarter, not necessarily harder. But my second book that I'm working on right now is actually called Ageless Intensity. It's right. how high intensity exercise influences the aging process. And Robert, that's something I know that you, you know, Robert recently contributed to an article I'm, I'm currently developing for, for the American Council on Exercise, because I know that's right within, I mean, that's what you do, bud. I mean, that's your, your sweet spot, right? We just, we just got done 30 minutes ago doing it right now. So we, yeah. And, yeah. and, that, and that, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about some of the benefits of HIT in general, mm -hmm. but really some of the benefits of HIT for yeah, for the over for the over fifty population. I mean, I turned fifty in two years, so um, yeah, I don't plan on slowing down anytime soon. And mm -hmm. you know, and I will talk about that as we get going with that. So, what do you want me? Do you want me to hit uh, share screen or yeah, go ahead and hit, hit share screen, and uh, it's all yours, brother. And we definitely, I'd love to um, if you have it in your presentations, show your book on there and where people can get more information from you. That would be awesome. Oh, I, I would never know what I would never have. That. <laughs> <laughs> I would never have that up there. So this is um. This is a presentation for everybody uh, listening for Robert. This is, you know, like I said, I do a lot of consulting work with StairMaster. And so some of the stuff we use, we're using with StairMaster programming, and I just really want to go over, um, I call, I'm calling this the overlooked benefits of HIT, you know, because really looking at the agenda, a lot of the things that we worry about in society, I mean, before COVID, and then it's still an issue, because obviously people who are a little bit older seem to be affected at a greater rate, but we're looking at aging and cognitive decline. You know, we, and really, so what I'm going to talk about is aging, cognitive decline. I'm going to talk about the general benefits of HIT, high intensity interval training, and benefits of HIT for slowing down the aging process, because there are some pretty significant benefits uh, to that. Uh, one thing I'm going to do real quick, because it's actually bothering me, is I'm going to turn down the, I'm going to take down the lights over my shoulder. One second. Try to get rid of that hot spot. There we go. Yeah, it looks a lot better. Sorry about that. I should have done that. Um, cause if I take down this other light, it'll, it'll be too much of a shadow. All right. So these are, we got the benefits of hits for slowing down the aging process and finally go over programming solutions. And I am going to talk about some programming solutions we can do from home, because if you're like, uh, if you're like me, if you're like everybody, you've been trying to figure out what you can do to, and you've been answering questions about how to stay fit now that we can't access our favorite facilities and our favorite equipment. So. First of all, we have to acknowledge that aging is not one single process. You know, aging doesn't just happen to one, one part of our body. It happens to all these parts of our body that we see up here on the screen. It affects our skeletal structures, it affects the nervous system, our immune system. And that's one of the reasons why, I hadn't even thought about that, but that's one of the reasons why um, right now this virus is having such an effect. It's probably on people who have very thrashed immune systems or weakened immune systems. Our vestibular is our balance system, temporal is our timing how you move, how part, different parts of your body move in relation to one another. Obviously our muscular system. And the one system, it's funny, Robert, I think the one system that many people often overlook in training, but it's the one influenced by every single thing we do exercise wise is endocrine. Yeah, you know, we really don't hear too much, you know, too many people talking about, hey, I'm going to the gym today to work on my endocrine system. But every time we go to the gym, that's exactly what we're doing. And then finally we have cardiorespiratory and cognitive. And, you know, there's always that, and I'm going to go into some of the, the cool science on this, and you know this well, is that there's that mythology of kind of the dumb gym jock, but in reality, you know, it's the complete opposite. People who exercise tend to have higher cognitive abilities. Mm. So real quick, um, I'm just throwing up some stats. This is kind of like the problem, right, is you have to identify the problem, and then you have to talk about the solution, is number one, we're all getting a little bit older. Nobody, nobody's going back in time. Nobody's come up with a flux capacitor yet. And if you don't know what the flux capacitor is, then you just got to do a little Google search for that. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but when you look at this, you know, we have one in 10, one in 10 Americans is diagnosed by, or one in 10 by age of 65 has Alzheimer's. And just so you know, and then I'll move on from this. I one time dated a woman. Let's just say that, that she was not, not an academic. She didn't realize it was Alzheimer's disease. She thought it was old timer's disease. She honestly <laughs> thought it was old timers, not Alzheimer's. Um, very, very dear woman though, but. Um, yeah, the uh, academics sure. is not her forte. <laughs> so when you look at it, one in 10 over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's and, th and the risk of developing Alzheimer's increases with age. And this has been a big area of study because obviously we have a rapidly aging population. So most of the research is saying what is happening? How is, how is this affecting our brain? How is this affecting cognitive decline? And what we're realizing, what the researchers are realizing that exercise can play a significant role 
in cognitive health and reducing this cognitive decline. It's not gonna eliminate it, but it can greatly reduce it. So again, projection, the reason why I put this projection up here is if we're fitness professionals, this is really our growth market, right? Is, you know, obviously you're always gonna have the younger market segments that wanna look good, that, you know, want the beach bodies and all that. But this is why I really respect and, and have a lot of appreciation for what you do, Robert, is that this is your market. I mean, you, you understand this, you identify this early on, and it's not, you know, you're, you're offering a very viable, probably one of the best solutions that's out there in our country, you know, and with the type of programming that I know you're doing. And I'm not just, I mean, I'm saying that legitimately because I know you know the science yeah. to it. Um, but this is really where you see, so as I'm going forward, it's funny, I've, I've been starting to work with more high school athletes, but really this has been an area where as fitness professionals, we really need to pay attention because this is where now that people are getting into their 60s and 70s, they're retired, they have more time. And for the most part, they have more disposable income or have, have the ability to spend money on the stuff they want to do. So this is really where we can take that opportunity and look at where the growth of our business can be. Um, general benefits of HIT. HIT, we know. You know, we know these things, weight loss, weight management. I, I don't really like, you know, saying, you know, we have to be a certain weight, but it's managing a healthy body weight. Mm -hmm. You know, there's actually a lot of research out there that, that people who are underweight or really super skinny live shorter distances than those of us that carry a couple extra kgs. So, um, you know, I always like to point that out, that, that if, if you enjoy your eating, you keep on rocking because it's actually not that bad for you um but like it's man kilos but, too well exactly <laughs> but it, 10 kilos over <laughs> exactly it, it's just but it, it's it, it's but i really look at it for weight management you want to have healthy weight management i think we, we put way too much um focus on weight loss as opposed to just managing a healthy body weight where you feel comfortable mm -hmm. one, one of my favorite clients one time said he said his whole goal for exercise is he did not want to have to buy a new wardrobe he didn't really care about watching his eating. He didn't, he's like, look, I, he did a lot of business dinners. He's like, I just don't want to have to buy new suits and just keep me in my suits. We'll be fine. Perfect. I love that goal. So, you know, people are to do hit for appearance. They do hit for cardiorespiratory health, but I don't think any, and, and hit people like hit because it's challenging, it's enjoyable and it's short. So we develop a lot of adherence, but I really don't think, again, just like nobody walks into the gym on Monday saying today's my endocrine day. Nobody's really walking into the gym on Wednesday and saying today's my brain health day. Mm -hmm. But if we do exercise the right way, that's exactly what we can influence. We can influence brain health. Now let's look at the reality of HIT. For those of us that, that are the SEC background, we know that that HIT really should be done the top way. You know, that that there should be a, a relatively consistent work to recovery ratio. That if we're optimally doing it, we know that if we're doing an anaerobic work interval of 10 to 30 seconds, utilizing our um, anaerobic, our, our lactate energy system of just pure energy, the ATP, CP energy system, then we're gonna, we need about a three to five uh, recovery to rest or recovery to work ratio. And so this is what we should see. So if we're working with an athlete, the top chart is what we should see because we need to allow for full ATP replenishment between mm -hmm. repetitions. But a lot of what we see in the gyms are this high volume interval training of where there's a lot of work, but relatively short recovery so what happens is you get this dropping line, you know, you get this decline of work rate because hit training done right, you, we should be able to maintain the same intensity with every interval. But if we don't have enough recovery, then our intensity will drop as the intervals go on. So when we look at that and that's where we get to common mistakes, right? It's not that nothing in fitness is bad. No tool in fitness in bad is bad, but it's how that tool is applied um, is really where we sometimes get off the rails. And hit is one of those, is definitely one of these where a little bit of hit is good. Hit can be extremely effective, but just like I'm not going to use a sledgehammer to try to fix my toilet, you know, I'm not going to use hit for every single, try to get every single fitness outcome. So common mistakes are a lot of times people program with high volume and minimal rest, and that increases the risk of injury. And when you look at this, when you, what happens if you have a lack of proper recovery, what will happen in the body physiologically is something called gluconeogenesis. Meaning if the body doesn't have enough time to replace, replace carbohydrate, to replace the ATP, cortisol will start catabolizing amino acids to turn, kind of convert them into glycogen or ATP. And amino acids should be used to, for protein replenishment, protein repair, not for energy. That can, that can you know, theoretically give us why we see so many quote unquote skinny fat people in the gym who do cardio for an hour at a time and go, why don't I have any muscle tone? Well, if you're doing a relatively high, if you're doing relatively high intensity cardio and you're not supplementing with any type of glycogen or carbohydrate, or you're not recovering properly, then ultimately your body can be burning protein and amino acids. 
And the one thing I'll ask people is, do you ever clothes ever smell like amino acid or, or ammonia? Do your clothes, do you ever, do you ever take that shirt off that workout shirt, throw it in a bag and leave it in your gym bag for the day or leave it in your car for two days? Maybe you forget to take it out and you pull it out to throw it in the wash. And if it smells like ammonia, that's a pretty good uh, indicator that you've been burning amino acids for fuel because mm. nitrogen is a component of amino acid. Nitrogen is a component of ammonia. So there's a similar smell there. So you can kind of do the smell test to think about, hey, I mean, it's after the fact, but that lets people know that they're training at a high intensity and burning protein instead of burning fat or carbohydrate. Just one of those little physio physiology things. Nice. So here are specific benefits. You know, we know these um, benefits. The one on the left that I think is really important to look at is mitochondrial density. Because mm -hmm. uh, what we're realizing with the aging process is that mitochondria are those little organelles in the, in the type one muscle fibers, the type one muscle cells that help utilize oxygen for fuel. And if we can improve, there's been a lot of study about mitochondrial density for long-term health in relation to slowing down the aging process and for cellular health. Then on the right-hand side, we know that high intensity produces the anabolic hormones. We know it can increase um, testosterone. We know it increases growth hormone. We know that elevates epinephrine, um, the catecholamines. We know the neurotransmitters. And one of the reasons why, why we like high intensity interval training is it's like a drug, right? It can increase our dopamine and serotonin levels as well. Just like heroin and just like other drugs, you know, literally that's the high. Especially if we do a really challenging workout, anytime you, you learn a new task, you learn new motor skills, and you, you accomplish those, the body will release dopamine. Dopamine is kind of like, hey, you learned how to do this properly. So it's that little injection of, ooh, I feel good. I, I did the kettlebell swing right. My coach said I did the kettlebell swing right. You get that little burst of like, I feel good. That's dopamine. So all these, all these things are adding up to these are the benefits. And now the bottom, um, the last one, lactate to BDNF, is some of the research on high-intensity exercise has found that the same high-intensity exercise that elevates levels of lactate, that elevates levels of growth hormone and mechanical growth factor, also elevates levels of BDNF. And BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That's mm -hmm. a protein in the brain. I'll talk about that in, in a couple minutes. But these are all like specific benefits of HIT. And we know that, that, one that one of the biggest benefits of HIT compared to steady state cardio is activation of type two muscle fibers and muscle motor units. And especially for an aging population, an aging population could go for a long walk. And that's actually one of my fears about right now is I see a lot of people walking for exercise right now, but are they getting the high intensity exercise they need or should be doing on a, two or three times a week to maintain, to maintain these important benefits? Because the other thing about activating type two motor units is it gets into the nervous system and helps your body become more neurologically efficient. So all these things are critically important for everybody, but even more so as we age, as we get a little bit older. And so how fitness happens, exercise, and we always, we always have to remember this, exercise is stress on the tissues. And right now it's really important to pay attention to, to stress. You know, if you're working with clients um, via Zoom, if you're, if you're doing online training, online coaching, one of the things to really ask about is their stress levels. How, how stressed are people right now in this certain environment? Because if they're kind of in a catabolic straight state, they really, we don't want to thrash them anymore by loading extra exercise stress on them. But if people are relatively chill, and like, hey, it is what it is, then we can kind of push them to work a little bit harder. Because there are basically two types of overload that, that, affect, that affect the body, that affect muscle growth. One is mechanical overload. And mechanical overload is to damage the actual structures. Mechanical overload from strength training, we know this, you damage the proteins, there's a signal to the, um, to the, the fibroblasts and the, and the growth factors to repair the damaged muscle tissue. That's mechanical overload. You use a heavy weight or you go to fatigue to damage the structures, that initiates the repair process. Metabolic overload is you work to a point of fatigue. And, and the interesting thing is in the research is you, know, you cannot isolate metabolic overload because if you do a metabolic overload, you do create some mechanical damage on the structures. And likewise, you can't isolate mechanical damage because if you do enough work to, um, to in influence mechanical damage on the st protein structures, you're also depleting um, metabolic, the metabolism. Now, here's one way that I think people don't realize that muscles grow is that when you work to fatigue, what you're doing is you're depleting levels of glycogen in the muscle cells, especially the type, you know, the type two muscle cells that store, that store glycogen. And this is the one time, I always point this out, Robert, this is the one time I'll give Tracy Anderson credit for being partially right, except I doubt very ser seriously she would be able to explain why. 
because because Miss <laughs> Anderson, and I don't know if people know who she is, but um, she's she's one of these fitness charlatans. Tracy Anderson will say that spinning will make your legs big, which it can because if you're doing high intensity indoor cycling all the time and you're depleting glycogen levels in the in the in the thighs and in the quadriceps, well. The, the compensation is the quadriceps going to store more glycogen. Glycogen holds on to water. You know, we get, I think it's like one molecule of glycogen holds on to three or four molecules of, of water. So you, you look at, or, you know, you look at that. So people that are out there trying to do exercise for weight loss and are going to fatigue all the time, they're actually initiating muscle hypertrophy if, you know, if they're resting and recovering the right way. So I just, you know, it always strikes me as funny as she says, spinning will make your legs big. And I'm like, I don't think she could understand, explain the physiology of that. I had, <laughs> a, I had a couple of clients that they would, they would make the same comment. They're like, I don't want to squat and lunge and do all this stuff because I can't, I can't fit in my jeans. And I would talk about muscle striation and then, the, you know, the retention with this and, you know, why if you ever watch like bodybuilders pump up, they don't do anything with their legs. It's all upper body stuff because the, you know, the striation, the muscle fibers, et cetera. And they're like, what about my jeans? And I'm like, just wait two days after you do your leg workout and you'll, you'll kind of be back to normal. And yeah. once we kind of had that discussion, you know, they're like, oh, it's just like almost like swelling to an extent, you know, like that's, it's a different uh, muscle fiber activation more or less that you're working with here, you know, from a pennied fiber to a, stri you know, striated fibers and such. It, it just, once you have some kind of explanation behind some of these things, I think that's some of my big hangups with some of the experts in the field is that they, they can't explain the whys. And, and so I was waving off the whole uh, discussion on that going, I'm not going yeah. to touch that one. But I, Well, it, I, it's I funny it. when, I, when I was going through doing some of the work on Nautilus, I was going through some of old, I, I went, I, I bought some of the old Nautilus texts that were available on Amazon uh -huh. and Arthur Jones was, you know, he, he was the guy who created Nautilus, but he had this protocol where he would, have, he would bring people out to Florida, bring bodybuilders out to Florida and say, look, I'll guarantee you, you'll get an inch in size and muscle size when we train. And the, the Jones protocol was to do one set to fatigue uh, or one set of each exercise to a point of fatigue and then rest for two or three days. But what happens during the rest period is you, your muscles store glycogen, your muscles will store extra water. So sure enough, they would do one workout the bodybuilder would go, well, I want to go back in the gym. And Jones would be like, no, rest for, for a few days. Then after three days of rest, the muscle would be half an inch or an inch larger because of the compensation from the extoring glycogen and the retaining water in the muscle. Nice. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Just if you understand the physiology, you can kind of manipulate really well. But, but a large point, I think a lot of people are walking around chronically overtrained because if they're always exercising at a high intensity, they're not allowing – um, the glycogen replaced completely in the muscles. And one of the things I think one of the, I've, one of the, I've done a couple of media interviews about right now, what, what people should be doing for exercise. And one of the things I've, I've been telling, you know, been telling reporters is like, think of this as a few weeks of active recovery mm -hmm. because people who go to gyms, in my opinion, are chronically overtrained. Like the hardcore exercise enthusiasts yeah. are chronically overtrained. So right now, if all they could do is body weight exercises at home, you know what, look at that as a form of active recovery. So what if you gain a pound or two, you know, unless you're, the Olympics are already canceled for the year. And so unless you're trying to get ready for the Olympic trials, there's no need to really stress about being at a certain elite level. Yeah. You know, that's just people, you just have to realize that, Hey, you know, just use the time for what it is. Use the downtime. Dan John has a, a great quote. Um, it's in, uh, can you go in one of his books? And he says, um, for the chronically overtrained under training feels wrong. And, and so they, we've got that mindset of like, I have to gas every day. I have to push every day. You know what I mean? And so you get into that, just con like you're saying, this constant fatigue state where you don't even get to reap the benefits of the work you're putting in. You know what I mean? So this is exactly. a great opportunity for some people to really experience that. Well, and especially for a lot of our clients over the age of 40 or 45, right? Yeah. Is, is there's absolutely nothing wrong with high intensity exercise for people in their late 40s, 50s or 60s, but it should be limited to two, maybe three days a week. You know, I would say two days a week for sure, three days a week if they're getting great nutrition and great, great nutrition, great sleep and great recovery, you know, just because it's like, but it doesn't mean don't exercise the other days. It just means you don't have to go to the point of where you're going to gas yourself. You know, you don't need to gas yourself every day, you know, and, and I think Dan, I love Dan's system of, of you know, the, the red light means don't train. Yellow light means train at a lower to moderate intensity and green light means go, you know, all systems rock and roll. And I think that's a very, um, you know, very systematic application of it. Then when we look at it, so I always, I always point out here, what I like to do is point out is the said principle, specific adaptations to impose demands is just the third law of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. It's like years ago, I realized, I'm like, wait a minute, all the said principle is, is just, you know, it's a, it's a variation of the third law of Newtonian physics of Love every it. action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, you know, for every, you know, the way we train is the way our muscles adapt. The stimulus we put into the body is how the body responds. And that's really where, you know, this other, the other parts of the slide, repetitive demands, if people are doing the same exercises over and over again, after a period of time, 8, 12, 16 weeks, we know this is general adaptation syndrome. The body's going to adapt, and they're going to have relatively – any extra load is not going to make any significant changes. But if you have variability, meaning one workout, you maybe use the rowing machine. Maybe another workout, you go for, for a run outside and do sprint intervals, and maybe the next workout, you do jump rope intervals. You can still do the same hit protocol. Like, say you do a Tabata on each one of those. You're just doing different demands on the system and using muscles differently. And that's really what, what there's some really cool science to show that variability can lead to optimal adaptations, you know, in terms of putting different loads into the body. And consistent variability is, is kind of the idea of, of nonlinear or undulating periodization of where you have some consistency between high intensity, low and moderate intensity days, because that, that's what really allows adaptations to occur. Because you can have a high intensity day followed by, you know, if you do a HIIT workout today for 20 minutes, you just gas yourself then maybe tomorrow do a yoga class or maybe tomorrow do a body weight TRX class of where you're working hard, but you're not using, you're not going to the same level of intensity. And I'm not saying that you don't work hard in yoga, but you're just working differently and it's a different type of hard work. Yeah. And just not being maxing out on your strength lifts those days, either, at, you know. Yeah. Up, you're not, you're not going to mass out the stress. You're not going to overstress yeah. yourself. I mean, you're still, yoga can still be challenging, but it's a completely different type of challenge than doing a you know, 20 minute hit workout. Absolutely. And it's that type of variability that we want to get into. So here's how HIT happens. HIT is at very energy expensive. When we do a high energy workout or a work bout, we deplete our ATP. That's, that's the chemical in muscle cells. And muscle cells only store about eight to 12 seconds, give or take, of immediate ATP. The immediate byproduct of that is an increase in hydrogen and an increase in lactic acid. So a lot of times you, you'll hear people say, well, it's the increase in lactic acid. It's like, not necessarily. That's just what they can measure but now, now that we get better instrumentation, better measurements, it's really, it's an increased acidity of hydrogen ions. So that's really that burning sensation. But that's really what, what you should realize is we do exercise, you feel that burning, that's an indicator if you get good sleep, your, your growth hormone levels would be up your, and your testosterone levels would be up. Because anytime you elevate lactate, the lactic acid, there's really, your body should have a higher anabolic response. So the recovery interval, and this is where, again, a lot of programming in fitness gets it wrong, we need the recovery interval because the work interval, say, say we're doing Tabata protocol and you're doing a, we're doing a 20 second Tabata protocol, that 10 seconds is barely enough time to, to replace you know, energy. In fact, it won't replace energy. So if you do one four minute Tabata protocol, that's really all that needs to be done. And if you are going to do more than, than, than uh, one four minute Tabata protocol in a workout it should be for different muscle groups or different, different movement patterns because you need time to replace that, that energy. Because the work interval itself is anaerobic, but the recovery interval is aerobic to replace. Because during the, and that's what people don't realize, is people don't realize that during that rest interval, your body is working aerobically to, to get rid of the metabolic byproduct, remove the lactic acid, remove the hydrogen, and replace, you know, to, to synthesize either gly, probably glycogen because it's quicker. You, you anaerobic, um, anaerobic glycolysis is quicker to replace that ATP. So it really is, your body is working during that recovery interval. You know, and it just is, it's a, it's, you, know, you, you have to use energy to replace energy. And that also gets into the idea of the afterburn, the epoch, the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. And that, that's a real effect. You know, the body is burning extra calories after exercise, but it's not that much. And what I like to point out to people is, what do you think most people do after a hit workout? I'm holding up my cup of coffee right here. They go, they leave, they leave, your, they leave your facility, they go next door to the coffee shop, they get a frappuccino and a muffin. Well, if you, look at the, if you look at the calorie boards in California, a frappuccino and a muffin are like 900 calories. Well, your, your body, you know, EPOC might be maybe 150 to 200 calories over the course of 24 hours, maybe, if you depending on lean muscle mass. So EPOC does not have a significant amount of, of you're burning more calories than rest, but it's not a significant amount. It doesn't mean you can go out and have that 900 calorie snack right after, 
hit workout. You know, people wonder why is my training not having an influ- you know, having an influence. We, um, we used to think. Um, sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. Please we do. used to think the epoch was a lot longer, right? Then we used to think it was like forty eight hours, and now it's like eight to sixteen or something like. Well, and there have been different studies. I mean, basically, uh-huh. what they're looking at is they're looking at baseline of homeostasis, right? Homeostasis, like we're sitting right now, is our is our resting oxygen consumption. So if we have a really, you know, and, and for listeners, you know, we, we burn about five calories of, of, we burn five calories of energy to use one liter of oxygen. And that's one thing I always point out to people because anything that we do that increases oxygen consumption, theoretically increases energy expenditure. Okay. And, and here's the real kicker. Anything you do above resting metabolism is, is technically metabolic conditioning. <laughs> you know, we, we always say metabolic conditioning for this high intensity stuff, but in anything reality, <laughs> what's that? Anything above? Well, if you go, because if now, now if you go above resting, now your energy metabolism is going to, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be using one of your metabolic pathways to produce energy for the, even if you're going for a walk around the block, gotcha. that's just low intensity metabolic conditioning, you know, you know, because anytime your body, your metabolism is working to produce energy for physical activity, theoretically, I mean, I'm just, I'm being theoretically, yeah, yeah. I'm being no, I got you. dorky on that. Yeah. Um, but when you look at that, but oxygen availability determines fuel utilization. So at lower intensity, like right now, listening to this webinar, we're in our fat burning zone, right? Mm-hmm. And obviously, if we have more lean muscle mass, our body might be more effective at, at using oxygen, convert to, to you know, oxygen and fat, free fatty acids to energy. But when we start working at a higher intensity, the body needs energy quicker. The body needs energy uh, available faster. And so what it will do is use glycogen and use ATP, uh, PC, the, the adenosine triphosphate and phosphocreatine. Mm-hmm. And again, that's really where you know, there's, that's this whole idea as we don't need to do hit with every workout. Some workouts we should do at a lower intensity steady state and work on our aerobic metabolism while other workouts, you know, if I do a really hard workout today, uh, hit training today, I should go for a steady state run or bike ride tomorrow to, cause that'll help me metabolize the bent leftover metabolic byproduct from today's hit workout. You know, it's just, it's being smart about it. The one thing about a hit is we know we get more net calories expended per workout because our oxygen consumption goes up. If you hear something in the background, I have a, I have a bulldog sleeping in a crate behind me. No, <laughs> so, we're all good. Yeah, I didn't know. I can hear her snore. I can hear her snoring you know, behind me. I, I've noticed it too. Like I have a, uh, I got a Rode mic, you know, the, yeah. the company Rode and I can hear everything. Like I can yeah. hear the chirping outside. I can hear my kids in the room, but if you don't have like it, that, we can't hear any of that, okay. but you can hear it with your headset on. I, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, I'm like, I can hear you guys whispering and I'll ask people and they're like, that, we, we didn't hear anything. So yeah, it's, it's interesting what mice can pick up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is what I like to point, because again, a lot of people, and this is where a lot of people, they study this stuff, right? We study this stuff when we're taking our certification. We may have studied this stuff in college, but then we get out and we start programming. We start working with clients and we just, you know, I don't want to say, it's just, we get, we get caught up in what we're doing day to day. And so I really appreciate one of the things I really appreciate what you're doing, Robert, is you're giving a chance now that we're not as busy is you're giving some people a chance to kind of brush up on their, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. And kind of like refresh the memory of this. Because if you look at this slide, this is the vertical axis is our volume of oxygen per minute. That's the amount of liters per minute we use. Remember, five calories per liter of oxygen used. And if we look at work intensity, that's a horizontal chart of it. And as we see, as work intensity increases, our body will use more oxygen. And the first ventilatory threshold, or VT1, is that point of where now we're expiring. Your body, below VT1, your body's burning primarily fat, free fatty acids. And then there's really no metabolic byproduct from that. I mean, there is, but nothing's going to influence breathing. When you start working harder and your body starts burning more carbohydrate, one, one, um, one offset or one, one out, output of um, carbohydrate metabolism is an increase in carbon dioxide. So that first ventilatory threshold is that point of where the body is going from using oxygen or using free fatty acids to using uh, carbohydrate or glycogen for fuel. And so if you have clients that want to, if you have clients that want to kind of optimize fat burning, and here's the other thing, some of the, some of the, um, the research on fasted cardio is actually pretty interesting is because if you do fasted cardio first thing in the morning, you have a higher level of cortisol naturally because you're using more cortisol to help your body wake up. And it can have a greater effect on fat burning if you stay below VT1. Because if, if you start working too hard, your body's going to naturally start using more carbohydrate for fuel. So there is, there is some, some science behind the, the, the gym mythology of fasted cardio. And then above VT1 is when we start burning uh, carbohydrate for fuel. And above VT1 can be aerobic uh, glycolysis. 
And VT2, the second ventilatory threshold, is where you start getting to anaerobic glycolysis. That's the use of glycogen without oxygen. And then above VT2 is where you start getting that onset of blood lactate. Because if you're using glycogen, if you're metabolizing gly glycogen for fuel, your body is naturally going to be producing more hydrogen ions as a result. And that's where blood acidity increases. That's why one of the reasons why we can sustain high intensity work for only a brief period of time is we start getting that increase in acidity in the blood, which that's that burning sensation we feel. I so mean, this is, what, this is what we do, right? But we just forget yeah. this sometimes. In the, in the transition here, just to, to kind of ask, because th these are the things, in all honesty, like this is the stuff that I had the hardest part kind of understanding was the transition of the systems. When, when you quote unquote, get your second wind, like you're, you're three or four rounds into a workout, the first couple bouts are just really taxing you and gassing you. You feel almost this point where you're like, okay, I'm starting to level off now. Like I'm, I'm working, we, we're transitioning to this new, you know, energy system at this point, right? Is that, is that kind of that transition to, to phase two? Yeah. And that's where there are a number of things happening with that, right? Because part of it is, and, and here's something crazy, right? You know, I, I did a, I was trying to promote a article on, um, on, on, you know, cannabis and exercise, your uh -huh. body has a natural cannabinoid system and cannabinoids, you have a natural cannabinoid in your body, which can help, you know, the re one of the reasons why CBD is so popular is you have a natural CBD receptor in your body, which limits pain. So at a certain point, when you start reaching that pain threshold in your body, you'll start releasing some cannabinoids as a, as a pain suppressant to, to reduce pain. So that's sort of, sort of what you're feeling when you, when people are like, when you get that second wind, if you will, you are kind of releasing some of those, you're, you're, you're releasing some of those things that decrease pain. But the other thing is, is just your body is becoming more efficient. And, and here's the thing that we have to remember, like if you're doing a really hard lower body, say you're, you're doing like jumps for 30 seconds, you know, doing you know, jumps for 30 seconds, you're going to be fatiguing, you know, those lower body muscles. They're going to be working anaerobically while your upper body and core muscles might be working aerobically because they're not working as hard. And then if you go from doing a lower body thing to maybe you do, now you're doing the heavy ropes and mm -hmm. you can see I'm flashing my arms up and down, but you know, now the, the lower body is, is, is working aerobically to recover while the upper body is working anaerobically to do that. And that's really where you can kind of alternate this. And I, you, with your program, Robert, I know, you know, you do that, but that's just sort of what's happening. And that's where your body will kind of kick in. Yeah. But, but also too, that second win is dopamine, serotonin, all these things. So yeah. those chemicals are being produced in the brain, but we feel good now, you know, cause, cause think about it too. I mean, it, it, we all know this, right? That first eight to 10 minutes of any workout kind of sucks, especially if you're a little bit tired, but what happens after eight to 10 minutes, boom, you start feeling good. Your oxygen's flowing, the, you know, your pain levels are being managed. Just, yeah. you know, it's, it's basically a whole cornucopia of chemistry going on in your body oh, when yeah. we exercise. We saw it in, in a couple of different, we did this with our older pops. Um, our, we have like a, two groups that are 60 and over for the most part. And they're on average, they're right around late sixties, early seventies. And I would do a uh, Tabata format with them. And we were scaling uh, or, or requesting an RPE from them after every set uh, based on the number that they were achieving. So basically if we were doing a jam ball slam or whatever it was, they would do eight in the 20 seconds. And then I would say, how hard was that? And they would call, it was a 10. They went as hard as they could. And then on the next one, you know, they get the same number. They would achieve eight again, but uh, it was maybe an eight this time. And then an eight again, and then an eight again. And by the time the workout was getting towards the end of that Tabata cycle, their perceived exertion on a one to 10 RPE, it came down a bit, but they were still achieving the same numbers they started with in the beginning. So it was kind of, as, as going through, I always like to give whys of like why these things are happening and why they're coming through. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of asking along this, like that second wind kicks in, you start to get this, this, you know, comfort level more or less of the effort you're putting out and your body seems to run much more efficiently than w right out of the gate, first activation, you know, of getting things rolling. Yeah. And, and that is, that's exactly it. And, and, you know, it, it's a whole bunch, a whole bunch of things popping in there. And a lot of that has to do with coaching too, right? How we, the, the language we use and the expectations we set is because, of, you know, to that point, if we tell people, hey, you should get between eight and 12 reps during 20 seconds, then they know that it kind of sets that expectation and gives them a specific work guideline. Here's just another chart of the energy pathways, right? And this is, this is the physiology. And this would be if we were training somebody for a competitive sport, like when we look, I always like to use the example of the 100 meter sprint. You know, a hundred meter sprinter, a hundred meter, a good hundred meter sprinter is not going to run three sprints within 20 minutes. We know that, you know, a hundred meter, a hundred meter sprinter might take 40 minutes to warm up, 
they run the hundred meter sprint in 10, you know, 10 and a half, 11 seconds. If they're, you know, collegiate, whatever level, um, sub 10, if they're, if they're world-class, but they're, they're doing this and then they, they have going to have another couple hours before their next race. So there's a lot more. And if they're doing a, a practice, they might run a hundred meter sprint or a 60 meter at a hundred percent effort but then there's going to be a longer recovery period because they want to work at their hardest effort. So this is, this is the science of what we know of how we should recover. But this is also why too, when we come to programming, we should only programming high intensity training in four to six minute blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in programming. I don't lever, if I'm doing a high intensity interval workout, I try not to program longer than six, maybe eight minutes. You know, if I'm working with people that I know are really well conditioned, I might do an eight minute block of hit, but then we're going to have a five to 10 minute block of lower intensity, you know, kind of core training or body weight training to recover from that six to eight minute, really high intensity block, because we have to respect, this is what we know about the physiology. These are the work recovery ratios that we should adhere to. So you can do a higher, you can do higher intensity classes, but you should program at about four to six minute blocks of high intensity, four to six minutes of high intensity, followed by four to six minutes, of relatively low intensity. And then you go back to high intensity just to respect the fuel sources. Now, now when, you look at, when you look at the four to six minutes, are you talking about total work time or, yeah. or undulation time? Total work time. To, okay. well, no, 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 no. I'd like a period. So like, it'd be like, say we're going to do a five minute Tabata period. And uh -huh. I'll talk about what that looks like in a minute. And then we could do like five minute, just core training where I'm not going to push you to work hard, where it might be, okay. we're going to do 45 seconds of a planks, 45 seconds of a side plank. But just that way, because I know what you mean. I'm not talking about five yeah. minutes of total, like, 20 second intervals. I'm just talking about five minutes total accumulated. Okay, okay good. Including the recovery. So that's a great question. So again, here's another, here's that, here's that chart again, but showing where about the energy pathways come in. So below VT1 is free fatty acid oxidation. Right at VT1 is aerobic glycolysis. Right around the second ventilatory threshold is anaerobic glycolysis. And that the highest level is just ATP PC. You know, so it gets into our fuel utilization. Um, and here's, and this is really what's, what's, why this is important for older adults as we age, right? Is we, this is how we can elevate levels of growth hormone and growth factors. I've heard it, I've seen it written as insulin-like growth factor. I've seen it written as mechanical growth factors. So I'm just labeling them as growth factors. But growth factors are, the interesting thing is they, they kind of elevate in, in the body after exercise in response to carbohydrate. So that's one of the benefits about taking carbohydrate post-exercise is it can elevate levels of insulin-like growth factors because they, the growth factors respond to the introduction of carbohydrate like insulin. They elevate in, in, with the introduction of carbohydrate. But what growth factors do is they work with growth, growth hormone for mechanical restructuring of, of the muscle fibers. You know, I'm going to go back up. The growth hormone is a peptide hormone that works on the nucleus of a cell. Growth hormone can help with um, the uptake of amino acids. And growth hormone can help with uh, fat burning. Lipolysis is, is fat, fat oxidation. And this is one of the things, I mean, one of the reasons women will produce more growth hormone in response to high-intensity interval training uh, because testi, testosterone is producing the testes. So when you look at the physiology of this, testosterone is producing the male testes. Um, males make about 10 to 30 times more testosterone than females. Females will make testosterone in, the, in, the, in their ovaries, but at a much smaller ratio. So the reason why I'm spending a minute on growth hormone is it has a much bigger effect on women. And there's one reason why women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s can have a great response to strength training yep. is they're going to be elevated levels of growth hormone, which is much more effective at fatty acid oxidation than doing, you know, doing 50 minutes of steady state cardio. You know, and plus at the same time, they're stimulating growth of muscle fibers. So this is really, you know, that's what we know in the science. But anecdotally, Robert, I don't know how many times I've had women come up to me in their 40s and 50s who've like, I've started doing weight training. And, oh my God, I finally have the body I've wanted. You know, that for years they were doing 50 minutes of cardio, doing all this, but now they're going weight training two, three, four times a week. And they're like, oh my God, I don't know why oh. I was scared of weights all these. I mean, yep. you've probably yep. heard that all the time, right? All the time. Oh yeah. And it's just, so it's like, and so then, and that's why I try to get, you know, with, with women in my demographic 40s and 50s is like, if they're not already doing strength training, do strength training. I mean, unless you have testes, which I don't think they would, <laughs> your, your body just isn't going to produce the testosterone to blow up overnight. And, and women see these images of female bodybuilders. Well, we all know they're supplementing with exogenous androgens. A lot of them are, are supplementing with androgens. You know, and it's, um, yeah, it's, just, it's funny. So when you look at this, so growth hormone is produced during, as a result of strength training and metabolic mechanical fatigue. But growth hormone along testosterone are produced during the REM cycles of sleep. So I don't know about you, Robert, 
But one of the things I've started asking people, or what I have asked people on like Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, is what are you doing tonight? You know, what, what, are, what are your plans for tonight? Because if they have, say they have concert tickets, you know, shares in town, they're going to go out to dinner and a concert. Well, I'm going to say maybe today shouldn't be your hardest workout. I want you to work hard, but don't thrash yourself today. Because if you have, if you have concert tickets, you're probably going to go out and have an extra drink or two at dinner. Or we're in California, maybe they have a little THC before they go to the concert. God bless them. You know, it's legal here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but they're not going to get great sleep because they're going to be staying out later than normal. They're going to be amped up, having an extra cocktail or two. And so that's not going to be the day I want them to train the hardest. But if you come in on it to a Saturday class and you're like, hey, what are your plans tonight? I don't have any plans. I think it was kind of hang out at home. Well, then it's like, yeah, rock and roll. You know what I mean? Because then you can have a much better sleep. Nice. And I think, you know, we got to think ahead as coaches. We got to start thinking like, okay, we're getting ready to do a hard workout. I have, I have a really hard workout program today. But first, before we go, what are your plans tonight? Do you, what do you, what, do you have big plans or are you just going to be hanging out tonight? Because if you have big plans, I don't want you. I don't want you to push your hardest, right? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, because that is just. Oh, it's, you, you, you you get the same response. Uh, Gary Schofield, the strength coach, he uh, he works with play now, but he used to do. We used to work at a, a Christian Catholic school in in Atlanta, and he had this great program that he would text all the athletes and ask them, "Do you have a test today? Are you going out with your parents or your girlfriends?" And I, like he would he would look at their weekly responses of when they're higher energy outputs were for stimulus for school and then their social life. And then he would, he would implement their max training components and all in the days that were off of that. So it's the same thing, like when they're going to get more rest, when they're not going to be stressed for the test they have to do or a final. And, and he did, he created this whole thing and then worked with a software company to actually make that to where all the kids could go and like input their schedules. He, he saw so much value and such a great response with that, that it, it's a, now a thing, like it's a software that, you know, that's that people cool. utilize. It's very cool. And it, yeah, I don't think we give nearly enough response or, or uh, attention onto that system and the recovery components, you know, your stress covers all levels that come from like a state we're in right now, right? Where everybody's freaking yeah. out about their business and all. I mean, there's a lot of different pieces that go into that. And all we think of as the coach is the 60 minutes I have in front of you. You know what yeah. I mean? That's, that's yeah, exactly. And, if I'm, and, and a lot of the thing about what a lot of people do in the gym too, right? Is they might go out to front and they might go out with friends on a Friday night. They might have people over for dinner on Friday night and maybe that an extra cocktail. Maybe instead of going to bed at 10, like they're normally doing during the week, maybe they go to bed at 11, 1130 on a Friday night. But then they come into the gym. So they've had an hour less of sleep. They come into an eight o'clock class in the gym. And they slam themselves at 8 a.m. on a Tabata class for an hour. And then at that night, they go out again with their friends. And, you know, it's just, it's like, that's, that's not optimal alignment, you know, where it's really, I would want somebody coming into the gym on a Saturday, do a yoga class on a Saturday and slam yourself on a Sunday because Sunday you'll probably go to bed at 930 to get ready for the week. Yep. Well, if you're 10 o'clock, 1030 is your normal bedtime, you go to bed at 930 on a Sunday. Well, shoot, I'm going to try to slam you on a Sunday morning because mm -hmm. I know you're probably not going out and having a couple extra cocktails on a Sunday night. You know, it's just, it's being smart about when we're teaching. Yeah. So I'd look at like maybe Sunday, Monday, you know, Sunday through Wednesday would be our harder training days. Whereas Thursday, Friday, Saturday would be the days of like, Hey, still move, but not, not jam you as hard, not, you know, a little bit more active recovery. I love it. Yeah. That's, that's at least, you know, kind of respect the physiology. So mm -hmm. looking at brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, um, that's a protein which keeps our neurons young and healthy, right? It, it increases, the cool thing is it increases neurogenesis formation and new, um, new cells in the brain and I forget it's angio something which cr increases the um in just like we we create new capillaries in our muscles when we exercise exercise will create new blood vessels and new new blood flow in the brain so really there's been a lot more research on this and the research is showing that exercise can elevate levels of bdnf and oxygen flow to the brain and just just one study alone saw that aerobic exercise two times a week can reduce the risk of dementia by 50 percent this is why you know, I don't know, and I'll talk about this in a couple minutes. Um, and just to do a plug, I was, I was telling Robert earlier, I am posting my podcast interview with John Medina today. So John Medina wrote yes. Brain Rules. He wrote Brain Rules for Babies and Brain Rules for Aging Well. And I interviewed him for the All About Fitness podcast, and that's going up uh, this afternoon. So it's a really good discussion on exercise, brain physiology. And I booked, I booked, this, I booked, the, I booked him as a guest in February way before COVID. And we ended up talking a little bit about the socialization because one of the most important things for the brain throughout aging is the social interaction. And so there's, there's a lot of research that, that, that oh, social interaction 
is as critical. And that's for you. That's why I love what you're doing with the group training with your population is getting getting somebody in their 70s to a group fitness class is as much about the socialization as it is about the exercise. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a win-win. I have, I have two clients I went and saw yesterday uh, just because they, they are uh, very down in this period. They're both uh, living by themselves, widow, widows, and, um, you know, I'm chatting to them from the driveway, but they, they're like, I miss the exercise. I love doing the online stuff with you but I miss everybody else like that. That, that was their thing to do three days a week was they got them out of the house. They would go hang with their buddies afterwards that were, yeah. it's such a big piece, you know, and we, and we don't take that. Now you've got a health component that is beyond uh, just, you know, having somebody to hang out and talk with, you see, there's real result that comes to that. You know, that's such a big part of what we're doing too. So yeah, you're, you're right on to that. And, and one of the things like one of the things Medina talks about is, you know, they actually did research when they had, they took a group of seniors, older adults in a facility, and they had them interact with people via Skype. And, and they found that, the, they, that over the study period, they interacted via Skype. They had higher, like the, the, their responses were better than people that didn't. So, wow. even, so even this type of socialization, even if we're socialization via, via FaceTime, Zoom, that's better than not socializing at all. Being person-to-person -person contact is best. You know, person-to-person -person socialization is best for our brain development and, and just overall health. But even this, this interaction right now, is better above baseline. So it's really cool stuff about that. That's so a couple cool. more studies on exercise and BDNF and, and what they're seeing is that whenever they give, they, they'll give a study group a cognitive test, they'll do the intervention exercise intervention, then they do the cognitive test at the end and they score better on the cognitive test after the exercise intervention. And there's been um, the, set, the bottom study here, looked at two, they had four groups. They had 80% of heart rate reserve, 60% of heart rate reserve, and they did it for 20 minutes and 40 minutes. And the vigorous and, and moderate for 40 minutes, the longer, the longer period had a better response on, on BDNF than the shorter periods. Now that study, it was only 45 people and they're 18, sorry, not 15 year old, they're 18 to 25 year old males. But what they saw was that the longer, more intense exercise had more, had better response for BDNF. Um, there's also been studies on the impact of HIT training on BDNF and what they found is HIT uh, maybe a more powerful stimulus for elevating serum BDNF in, in, the, in the blood compared to moderate intensity exercise. And that's, that's really, I mean, this is really powerful stuff, right? Is because it's like, hey, so if you look at the multifactorial, we're burning, we're, we're burning calories. We're, we're enhancing our type 2 muscle fibers. We are now also realize there's a cognitive benefit just to physiology. But then if you put the socialization into it, I mean, that really is where things um, can become very powerful. And there's also been research on this of where um, hit for shorter intervals is actually more, can actually be more pleasurable. People would rather do a 20 minute hit class than like a 50, 60 minute steady state class. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. When they do a 20 to 30 minute hit class, they know they're going to get over with. They know it's going to be hard. It's going to be short. It's, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be challenging, but it'll be over before you know it. And that's really where there's actually some interesting research on that. Um, and the bottom one here, and this is what I want to put in here right now, this, this research, Robert, was published in 2018. And what it did, it had three groups. It had, had one group that ran on a treadmill. They did a, a four-minute they did a four minute Tabata protocol on a treadmill. You had another group that did a four-minute Tabata, Tabata protocol, body weight exercises. And then you had a third group that did a 30-minute um, steady state, moderate intensity treadmill work. So the first two groups did 12 minutes of work a week. The, the, the third group of 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes on the treadmill did 90 minutes of work a week and, yeah. and what they found was was that the two tabata groups got much better results in 12 minutes a week than the, the treadmill group at 90 minutes a week yeah the, the four minutes a week on the treadmill had the highest results but the but the or the 12 minutes a week on the treadmill had the highest results the 12 minutes of the week of the body weight training had pretty good was really close to the treadmill um and the 12 minutes a week of body weight training was better than the 90 minutes a week of of steady state training Mm -hmm. So I want to put that in here for people right now at home, because if, you know, you can't do your favorite workout, you know, gas yourself. And, and that, that research, the, the um, exercises they did for, they did mountain climbers, burpees, they did um, squat thrusts with weights, and they did something, and I forget what the other exercise was. But if you come up with a, you know, you just come up with a four exercise circuit, and you do each exercise twice in a four minute Tabata, and you push hard, I mean, you have to be out of breath in that four minutes. That can be, according to this research, it can be, you know, it was a 16-week study too. So it was a longer study period than eight or 12 weeks. And so it's pretty, it, it, it's not, it doesn't, 
and I'll say this right now, research doesn't prove anything, but it just shows that there's some evidence that, that apply the variables the right way, you should get an outcome that you want. So models that work, um, just we're talking about Tabata and modified Tabata, um, variable duration interval training means we do it different lengths. Mm -hmm. And this is one, these are two that I've been having some fun with, are you the know, Copenhagen like, protocol, the 30-20-10, yeah. yeah. and ladders, so where you do like 30, 20 seconds of work, 40 seconds of recovery, 30, 30, 40, 20, that's climbing the ladder, then you come back down. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's six minutes, right? So this is between four and six minutes of programming. And this is what, what I've started doing with some classes is we'll do two minutes at the bottom, and then we'll take one minute off. We'll do like one minute of like balance training, and then we'll finish the two minute Tabata. So we, we, what we're doing is we're doing a five minute Tabata protocol instead of four minutes. But that way, what I want is I want all the Tabata intervals, to your point earlier, I want all the work intervals to be at a relatively high intensity. But, you know, if we don't, if I've found that if, if we try to go straight through, that last minute looks like crap. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd rather give you a minute break in the middle, or I'll do this in a cycling class where we do two minutes of really hard. We do a standard two-minute Tabata, and then we'll do one minute steady state, and then we'll finish the two-minute Tabata. It's just giving people a little break, right? I mean, you know, we're not working with an athletic population, and I don't want to slam people into the ground. And But but this is how I'll finish a 40 or 45-minute cycling class is I finish with a bout of hit, you know. Because part of it, too, is psychology is I want people walking out of a class feeling like the class is really hard. I don't need to slam them to a wall for an entire 45-minute workout if I make the last five minutes really hard. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, love, I love seeing this because you really you've got a minute 20 because you have the 20 from the fourth set, but you're going right into some kind of active recovery component. You know, their yeah. cardiovascular output is going to give them at least, you know, 80 seconds to recover from that. And then you're right back into it again. I think that's yeah. fantastic. You know, the uh, amount, I'd be curious to see like what their output performance is the next four sets. Now that you've given them that, you know, extra bit of, of work, uh, of rest, you know, in there to the work ratio on the other side. Yeah. And, and, and it's pretty, I mean, I don't, I don't quantify it in like a cycling class, but I just, I can tell that people have, it's like, okay, they go too hard for two minutes, then you give them a little break. Then they, they have that ability to finish really hard. And I'll talk about it too at the end about why it's so important to kind of use some of this timing and said specifically, and this is the Copenhagen protocol, yeah. and that, that's the formal of the 2010. Yeah. And, and for people that aren't familiar with it, 30 seconds is relatively steady state. 20, so 30, if, use an RPE, 30 seconds might be an RPE of five out of 10, 20 seconds might be an RPE of, of seven or eight out of 10, and then 10 seconds is an RPE of 12 out of 10. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just, oh, it's like, a, and if you do this right in five minutes, it's a good, I mean, the, the full study is you have three five minute protocols, in, in like 20, 25 minutes. But this is, this is what I mean by doing, if I'm programming a class, Robert, I might do that five minute Tabata protocol. And then I'm talking about a conditioning class. And then we might do five minutes of body weight core training. And then I might do a five minute Copenhagen protocol. And then I might do five minutes of active recovery stretch. And that's going to be it. That's going to be like a 25 minute workout. Nice. You know, but you know, we're doing two, we're doing two five minute blocks of really hard exercise and maybe two five minute blocks of moderate exercise of body weight stuff but it's really just trying to understand the programming with it. Um, and then here's that variable duration, a ladder. You know, you kind of see on the left is a percent intensity. You start with 20 seconds of work, 40 seconds of active recovery, 30 seconds. And as the work intervals go longer, the intensity, the output drops a little bit. Like I don't anticipate somebody being able to sustain 100% work rate. And I tell them that we're going into a 40 second, you're going to do two 40 second work intervals back to back with only 20 seconds of recovery in between. So I don't anticipate that you're going to do your hardest work, and I don't want you to. If I try to coach them up for these 40 seconds, I want you to go hard, but not your hardest, you know, that, that, and really try to get them to understand that. And ladder, again, so in a class, I might have a Tabata interval. We mm -hmm. might do body weight training. We might do active recovery stuff. Then I might have a ladder to finish class, and that's going to be it. I'm only going to do, in a, in a 20 to 30-minute workout, I'm only going to probably program two really hard blocks of exercise and the other blocks are just going to be basic core, core weight stuff. But if you make one of those blocks, the last, the last block they do, that's what they're going to remember. That's where they're going to walk away going, woo, that was really hard. You know, and that's really where we don't need to gas them. On the, on the Copenhagen's there, Pete, the recovery is a, is a 10 second as well. So they're 30, 10, 20, 10, 10, 10. I don't do, I don't do any recovery. I don't do switch. So we go 30, 20, 10, then we go right into the next 30 second cycle. Because that 30 seconds is kind of like a recovery of, of itself. I see. Okay. Yeah, so that way they, they finish 10 seconds really hard. Then we drop right back into, okay, now. 
So say we're doing an indoor cycling class. It's like, all right, 30 seconds of flat road. Let's increase, let's increase the gear. Let's increase that resistance. Now we're doing 20 seconds. Let's increase that resistance one more time. Now I want you to stand up and go really hard for 10 seconds. And then what we're going to do is back that resistance off and go in the saddle for 30 seconds of steady state flat road. That's okay. how I use, this is where I like, I like using this a lot in indoor cycling because it's uh -huh. easy to control and you can go 30 seconds flat road, increase the gear, 20 seconds with gear on the flat road, increase resistance more, come out of the saddle, work really hard for 10 seconds and then come right back into the saddle. So it's an easy transition period for indoor cycling. Uh, that. that's, that's really where I love using this, this one. Nice. Um, and then the equipment, I just want to acknowledge this is some of the equipment. Obviously, I'm, I'm a Stairmaster guy. Um, these are the different pieces of equipment you know, made by Stairmaster. All of our Stairmaster stuff is hit, but you can do it on any equipment, right? And, and the one thing I'll say about, like, the, I'm, I'm a big fan, though, of if you look at the lower left hand, you have the, this, this is the Stairmaster hit bike, mm -hmm. and this is our new hit rower. But rowing machines, Concept Twos, the assault bikes, anything that you get the upper body load working together, you're going to increase energy expenditure. Like anytime, and, you know, and I kind of, the, the box masters, our boxing is our boxing piece of equipment. I kind of call boxing like sprinting for, for the arms, right? Because we, a lot of times we sprint for our legs, but we don't do anything with the arms. But heavy ropes stuff is sprinting the arms. Now, real quick, body weight solutions here at Calisthenics. So you can do this stuff at home with jumping jacks. So you can do jumping jack. Traditionally, we do jumping jacks, arms and legs moving together. But when I was taking the Gary, when I went through Gary, the Gray, Gray Institute, we came with all kinds of variations. Like I might move my arms in the, in the um, transverse plane while my legs move in the, front, in the frontal plane. Nice. I might split my legs forward and back in the sagittal plane while moving my arms in, in the frontal plane. So you can kind of come up with some variations of jumping jacks, again, getting the arms and, and legs moving together. And one of the things we've been doing for, 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 for core health and fitness is we've been putting up um, almost every day, different master trainers have been putting up workout videos and one of, the, one, of the, um, one of the workout videos I did was a, uh, was a Tabata alternating between jumping jacks, body weight squats, mountain climbers, and push-ups, you know, four exercises mm -hmm. and rotating through, we do 20 seconds each. That's going to gas you, you know, and lateral bounds, that's the technical term. They're ice, what a lot of people call ice skaters. Mm -hmm. Hey, running in place can be a great, you know, but you have to do proper form. And you know, I don't know if you can see if people can see the video, but it's always funny. I try to dry, get people to drive from their elbows so that so their elbow stays bent, and you see people bend their elbows. It's like no, 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 you're not drinking. You're driving those. You, know, you wanted people to drive their elbows back. So you try to get you try to get get people. And then step throughs are. I'm, I'm a big fan of step throughs, except it looks like you're break dancing. I can never break dance in the '80s, but if I do step throughs, I at least feel. I just can't do it to any rhythm. That's um, here, here's some basic pieces of equipment, and these are the pieces of equipment that I use in my book. Um, but people, these are very easy to buy, except I've heard, um, I don't know if, you, if you've heard this too, I heard Perform Better is basically all out of, of, of resistant, of rubber resistance. They're, they're pretty much out of a lot of stuff. I know they, they've been searching, like even just the door anchors that we've had, I've had four different clients end up with four different anchors than they originally had. Mm -hmm. So I think they're trying to kind of pull and get stuff from wherever. But yeah, they're the ones that we, I use them for everything and anything we can get. And we were early on with this whole COVID action to have our clients act and get stuff. So we were, you know, pretty good at it. But from, yeah, from what I but understand it, now, they're, they're out of a lot of stuff. Well, company, company, a couple of companies I work with, Robert, they, their factories shut down. China, China shut down their factories in mid-January. Yeah. So yeah. from mid-January to, to the time COVID hit us in March, nobody was producing anything in China. So if it wasn't on a boat, if it wasn't in a container on a boat in early January, it wasn't it's out, we're out of stock, you know, so factories you know factories in china are just coming online the last two or three weeks and even then certain factories might be up and running while other factories might not be depending on where they are what province they are and everything so we are going to be out of supply chain like you know i bumped into a friend of mine the other day who works for a, a equipment manufacturer he said they're pretty much out of equipment because people have been coming to them they'll take old treadmills and stuff and refurbish them and sell them to secondary fitness and, and home markets okay. and they're basically you know, out of equipment, but this stuff, the only thing you can't get at a Target or a Walmart are those two arm bands. And I'm a huge fan of those two arm bands um, for all types of strength and metabolic exercises. But these are, this is equipment you can easily get at home and you can easily do different exercises with at home. And, you know, people realize that if you, if you haven't tried to do, if, if you want a good 20 second interval, do squat to overhead press with dumbbells oh. for 20 seconds. And that's going to gas you. We did them today. They're my least favorite, but they work so great. But, but they work because so much your body mass is working. Absolutely. And that's the other thing is say you only have a 10 or 15 pair, pound pair of dumbbells. Well, just do more repetitions to fatigue. Remember, mm -hmm. I mean, we want to create mechanical or metabolic overload. 
And so just do repetitions to fatigue is enough to get, get the overload going. You're, so, you're probably much better at this than I am, but I have a really hard time talking and training and doing at the same time. <laughs> and and you, you have more experience at it. But when I'm doing a squat and press, I can't coach. I can't speak. I'm just like, guys, just let's get through this. And I'll tell you, I'll coach <laughs> you on the next one. It's just, they're so difficult. Yeah, that's, and that's yeah. just been, you know, right. That's just, I've been a group exercise instructor for yeah. years. And that's, that's where that, that, that those worlds kind of collide. So this is one thing, Robert, you kind of alluded to this earlier. This is the flow state, you know, and, and this is one thing that, you know, how many times have we been in a workout where we've totally forgotten about, like all of a sudden, wait, wait, wait workout's over? Well, this is something, you know, Chick sent me high. Um, Mihai Chick sent me high is his full pronunciation. Oh, wow. I, he's, a, he's a psychologist actually up in Claremont McKenna. Um, he, he identified the flow state 30 years ago. And this is what, you know, so when athletes get in the flow, you're fully immersed in the actions of the present moment. You're fully locked in. This is why telling people it's a 20 second work interval, it's a 30 second work interval, why it's so important. If I tell you that I want to work really hard for 30 seconds, I say you have 10 seconds left, I am giving you that expectation of how hard you have to work. Yep. That can help put people in the flow state. That can help, that's a flow trigger of telling you I want to work your hardest for 20 seconds and give people, all right, we got six seconds left, we got three seconds left. That way they know they only have a specific amount of time. What we're trying to do is we want people to bend but not break. You know, when you look at like, if you look at like the Red Bull teams, any, those athletes get into flow. I mean, they, they're, they're in flow because they're challenging themselves. If you're going flying down a hill on a mountain bike, you know that you have to focus immediately on what's two to three meters in front of you. I can't worry about what's 50 meters in front of me because I got to deal with what's three meters in front of me. You know, and that's, that's really what we're trying to do in a, in a class, right? If I, that's where I can get people to work their hardest. If I give you a four minute to Pavada, I can get you to crank out your hardest effort. In that. I don't want you to worry about what's going to come later. I want you to focus on the next four minutes, and not even the next four minutes. I want you to focus on the next 20 seconds. If we can kind of set those expectations in class, that's where, that's where people will tell you, I didn't even realize how hard we were working, is we're getting into, because flow triggers are dopamine, serotonin, adamine is another neurotransmitter. That's basically, this is how we use exercise as a drug. You know, if, we can, if we can get people into flow, um, we can exercise you know, as a drug. There's a great book out there called um, Stealing Fire, which goes into the altered states economy. And I had one of the authors on the podcast a couple of years ago by the name of Jamie Wheel. And we talk about flow triggers. I had Chick sent me high on, I, I had Chick sent me high as a guest as well. Um, he's a little bit hard to understand. He, he's Hungarian. So his accent was a little hard to understand with the interview. But really just understanding if we can get people to get into a state of flow, we need to set clear goals with intensity, with time, with effort, and give them the feedback. We can create that flow trigger in our group exercise class. And that's also the other benefit of breaking it up in four to six minute or six to eight minute blocks is we let people know you're only going to work really hard for the next short period of time. I want you to work your hardest. It's only four minutes. I want you to do your hardest effort. After this, we'll have five minutes of body weight exercises. I'm not going to push you as hard, but I want to really challenge you for the next four to five minutes and then we can go from there. And that's really... Yeah, you know, have you ever done? Have you ever looked at the? You know, have you looked at this in this format, Robert, of where you're really trying to initiate this and in, purposefully? No, not not specifically like this, but I, I really like the uh, the idea of that that flowing component. You know, you as soon as you mention it, I'm like, I know, I you know what I mean. You you kind of connect the mindset to like, I understand that. Yeah. But I've never. Um, heard it presented or, or given the title of that before. My, my wife said it to me the other day. She's like, you're that student in school who, who knows the stuff and has experienced it, but doesn't know what the name of it is. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, but every one of you I've, I've spoken to this week, I'm like, I know that. I know exactly what that yeah. is. Now I have a name for it. You know, so I dig, I dig that. And this is the flow state. One of the coolest things that, yeah. that, you know, Stealing Fire, that book is Stealing Fires by Stephen Kotler and, and Jamie Wheel. And they start out with, with the Navy SEALs, right? Because that's what, if you look at what special operations training is doing, is special operations training is trying to get you out of self and get you into a team, into a cohesive unit of where you're not thinking about yourself, but you're thinking about the needs of the unit. Mm -hmm. And so with every mission they do, that's a very, you know, the, the, the way they train, the way they operate is a very flow driven environment because they're trying to get into everybody working together. And like the reason why I have the Red Bull team on there is on their first book, Stephen Kotler's first book. The Rise of Superman, he documents his team about what they're training. What they're training to jump through, they, they did a base jump off of, um, it used to be called the Sears Tower in Chicago, and now it's called mm -hmm. something else. But the, the members of the team were talking about, like if you were the first guy in the Red Bull team and I'm the guy following you, as soon as I saw your right foot move, I know I need to be doing something. 
because that's how that's how closely they work together. That's how how tied in they were. Because if I as soon as I saw your foot move, I know I need to get ready for my turn to get ready for to fly because they they jumped off. They did a base jump off the the Sears Tower and then flew down through. They did these wingsuits down through the cities of Chicago to land. I mean, it's really gnarly stuff. That's cool. But that's what big wave surfers, mountain bikers, all these guys they operate on is they operate in the flow state. On the flow so state. So create your hit. This is really where this is how you create a class or create a workout is you have to look at what equipment you have available. Do you have dumbbells? Do you have a kettlebell? Do you have a band? Or do you just have body weight? And what protocols? And I always look at kind of like, you know, I create, I, may, I might do one Tabata protocol. I might do one variable intensity. But then, I, like I say, I alternate. We do a warm up. We might do one, one Tabata block where it might be, I'm not going to push them to, be, to go their hardest. Then we do about five to six minutes of body weight training. And then we're going to finish off with another protocol where I really try to gas them. And that might be, and then we have a cool down. That might be a full 25 minute workout. Mm -hmm. You know, and people might go, well, we didn't work. You know, the research, and I, I'm sure you're well aware of this. I mean, the research on hit is less is more. And I just interviewed Martin Gabala and I'll be, re, re, I'll, I'll, be um, I'll be posting my interview with, with Dr. Gabala next week. But, I, but Marty has done all the research, a lot of the research on HIT training that we all use. And Marty, you know, time and time again in his lab, you know, 10 minutes is all we need. You know, a little bit of a warm up, four to five minutes of high intensity, a little bit of a cool down. And we get a good 10 minute workout and that can be an, enough of what we need. Now, would I tell you to train for an ultra marathon like that? Absolutely not. But st staying at home right now, that can help maintain, um, help maintain our fitness level. So obviously... I, <laughs> there's the stuff, uh, there's the podcast I've been talking about. Um, uh, we do have this, you know, we do have a, a hit, um, we do have a hit program online um, by Stairmaster. That's, you know, we also have uh, a Schwinn program online and we are just getting ready. The, the cool thing is, I mean, this is kind of like a highlight of, of my career, right? Is I'm getting to work on Stairmaster and all this equipment and Stairmaster and all this education. And we're, we're just finishing up. We're in, the, we're in the final review right now of our Nautilus. But another two to three weeks, we'll have a Nautilus uh, strength coach program up online to really kind of reintroduce. This is the 50th anniversary of Nautilus this year. So we're really trying to reintroduce, or our goal was to try to reintroduce. We had plans for uh, Ursa and FIBO uh, this year that kind of got thrown out the window. We're going to be kind of relaunching Nautilus machine circuit training this year um, mm -hmm. just because it's the 50th anniversary. But there are a lot of benefits, and especially for an older population of people in their 60s, People should be doing heavy strength training in their 60s or 70s, but, you know, unless they have great form, not necessarily barbells, and that's where machines come in really beneficial. Yeah. So machines don't, don't trump other things, but, you know, I, if I, in, an ideal, in an ideal world, I'd have, two, I'd have people do like two days a week of like the type of training you do, and then mm -hmm. one or two days a week of machine circuit training, you know, to kind of, you know, to kind of alternate that. Yeah. You know, if you ask me, if I, if I were going to develop, if I were going to develop a studio from scratch, I'd want the studio to have a TRX component. I'd want a machine circuit training component. I'd want either a rowing machine or like the, the, the air, the salt bike component. Um, and that would be kind of like the full on, that would be the perfect studio, right? Is because then you could do your metabolic, high intensity metabolic day, yep. your lower intensity body weight day of the TRX. And then you'd have your machine training day to get the overload, you know, the mechanical overload. And we've, just, been, we've been trying to get the space next to us for a few years now. We have we have a first right of refusal on that, and we are trying so hard to get that spot. I want to do some turf and have some space in there where we could do some sleds and all this. But I also want to have some space to put in some plate loaded stuff and have some you know some set machines that we could do some heavier you know guided lifts on with that because I, I do think it has its place. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. For what it does, uh, I just don't you know I don't have the room for it. But I'm, I'm it's a room and expense. I mean, that equipment is expensive, but at yeah. the same time, um, the benefit about using machine equipment is it lasts for years. I mean, they're, you know, if you, if you maintain it well, if you invest in a couple of machines, I mean, your members will get a lot of benefit out of it. Because mm -hmm. you know, you, when you look at it, I mean, what machines do is they put, they put, they focus the mechanical loading directly into the working muscle. And that's what Joe's realized with his cam and everything, or any machine, you know, your Cybex machines. I mean, they, it's what you're doing is you're loading specifically into the working muscles. Whereas, you know, free weights, we know there's just, there's dissipation of load and different force curves and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, the, my book is uh, my, in my book, I go through metabolic conditioning. I go through mobility training and I go through core strength training and uh, there's a podcast. And like I said, I'm, I'm working on my second book right now called ageless intensity, how high intensity exercise slows down the aging process. So Nice. Uh, and the and the interesting thing about this and, and and Robert, I don't know if you've realized this, but up until like the early up until 
um, the, the mid 2000s because it was the mid 2000s when CrossFit started exploding in popularity. Mm -hmm. But up until up until then, the, most of the research on high intensity exercise was specifically for an athletic population. Mm -hmm. They would look at high intensity exercise like Tabata, you know, Izumi's research was on speed skaters, right? It was on working on aerobic capacity of speed skaters. So all the research up until about the mid 2000s of, of high intensity exercise was really focused on an athletic, how does this influence an, an, an athletic population? But then about the mid 2000s, when more of the general population started doing high intensity exercise, since about 2004, 2005 on, the research has kind of expanded to look at high intensity exercise for health benefits. I don't know if you've seen that, you know, it's been like, as I'm going through the research for, for the second book, I'm like going, oh, wow, there's a huge split here oh, yeah. of where prior to in the, in the 90s and before, the research of high intensity stuff was specifically for sprinters, football players, rugby players, whatever. But since about the mid 2000s, it's been like, how does high intensity exercise apply to the general population? One, one of the best components of, of CrossFit and their marketing campaigns has been introducing that to the general population. Because I don't think a lot of people even knew what it was. You were either doing LSD cardio, long, slow distance, uh, or you were just lifting weights uh, in a combo of the both. So yeah, it was definitely a groundbreaker that created all kinds of different formatting and programming and you know, oh, yeah. has led to what it is today. So Well, think about it. Think about it from this standpoint. I mean, how many gyms did you walk in around 2000, 2001 that had, had Olympic platforms in them? You know, they're like yeah. the only, I knew one gym in the DC area where I was living at the time. Yeah, that was like a special powerlifting gym out in the boonies that had Olympic platforms or sandbags or anything. It was all machines or dumbbells. Yeah, and, and now, like now you go into almost any 24-hour, you know, you go to any big box gym, yeah. and that they probably have multiple two to four platforms in there. You know, that's and so that that's been a good stuff. So, well, I can take a few. Let's say this do if we have anybody with any questions from. Um, well, I I go. I know we had one on there. I don't want to keep you on here too long. No. Um, we, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm so busy. <laughs> I got so many places to I, go. <laughs> I need to a question up here. Um, on the, uh, aerobic exercise decreases in risk for dementia and Alzheimer's, how long, what type and how hard just to give some direction on implementing that. Uh, that was your, your slide back there with the, the brain lifting weights. Yeah, that that's, and actually the different studies have been like between 30 and 45 minutes of just steady state. And that's where that one that 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 one that that Medina referenced in his book Brain Rules. It was um specifically two times a week. They did two times a week of thirty minutes at a time. And as I was kind of going through, as I'm going through this stuff for um for for my book, I'm gonna hold this up. I don't know if anybody can see this. this is like some of the new some of the stuff I have on my on my desk right here. This is a meta analysis of aerobic exercise on um on BDNF. And what they're finding is again any, anywhere between twenty and forty minutes of steady state aerobic exercise can be beneficial for elevating levels of BDNF. So for now, like where I live in, in Carlsbad, California, I see more people walking around my neighborhood than I ever have. And if you go out and walk at a brisk pace for 30 or 40 minutes, there's a definite, not only a health benefit, but a cognitive benefit as well. Absolutely. And then uh, Beth put a, a post up on here just saying, thank you for being here. She's got to go run off to run some errands for a client of hers, uh, Beth cool. and, and tell. So she wanted oh, okay, to, cool. to know yeah, she no was problem. saying hello. Yeah, well, we cool. really appreciate it, my man. Thank you for spending so much time and, and putting this whole thing together for us. This was very cool. I look forward to your, your book. I love the, uh, the podcast. I, how many episodes have you done now? Are you, you're over? I stopped. Well, apparently iTunes likes it. If you don't have the numbers up front, uh, I probably have over 230 episodes. Yeah. I think I remember um, being something over a hundred and I was like, wow, this is. Yeah. You, you, you were, you were guest number 80 something a couple of years ago. I need to have you back on now. I'm going to kind of circle back and have a, have a few people on. So um, especially dude, I mean, you're doing awesome stuff with your programming, man. I love when you write about your programming because you're right enough. There are a lot of people out there that don't realize that the older adult population has a great response to, you know, can have a great response to high intensity training. They just have to be progressed the white right way, right? Absolutely. You don't start them. You don't start your clients at the highest intensity, <laughs> but if they're with you for six months, then you can start, you know how to push them and you know how to push them safely. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Pete. I'd love to come on, man. Anytime you want me, let's, let's do it. So yeah, thank you very up. much. I appreciate everybody being on with us. Uh, we'll have the recording posted out here in a bit. And then Pete, are you cool sending me this um, PDF slide so people yeah. can, can view this? Yeah, cool. I'm going to do a big Dropbox to everybody at the end of the week. So Probably cool. on Sunday, I'll mail that out to everyone. All right, man. Well, hey, thanks. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Dude. And yep. thanks everybody for for staying on and, and giving me somebody to talk to other than my dog. Good, <laughs> you're a good man. Thank you, Pete. Take care. Yeah, take care. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.